Hey guys, it's Amy and Ben here. On Thursday night, we went out for a date night. It's very rare for us to do because we are parents of a little baby girl, as you can hear. (laughs) And it involved a lot of delicious wine, a lot of delicious dumplings, and a little known movie with a little known superstar, Brad Pitt in Ad Astra. Yes. So we don't really get to go to the simmer that often, but we were really hyped when we saw the trailer. Mm-hmm. I think we did two reviews for it yep. and we thought what better movie to kind of venture out back into the real world of adulthood mm. than with a bit, of, a little bit of a space adventure. Definitely. So we love a good sci-fi. We love a good space adventure. And we expected big things from this yeah. one. Yeah. So what we'll do with this uh, particular video is we're going to go into a deep dive analysis of it. It'll start with the premise. Then we'll do a bit of ending explained. We'll talk about the themes, etc., and what our major thoughts are. So obviously this is going to be filled, riddled with spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie and you do want to watch it, switch off now and come back because this is meant to enrich your experience as a companion piece to the movie itself. We're not really into spoiler-free reviews. You can go to, to Wikipedia or, or Roger Ebert for that. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, feel it, yeah. Get- I don't get spoiler review, uh, non-spoiler reviews. I'm like, what, what, are, what exactly are they reviewing if they can't talk well, about what they watched? they don't really discuss, can they? They sort no. of go, uh, beep. Yeah. <laughs> this is about beep. Yeah. Anyway. So let's start with the premise of this in case you guys have been living under a space rock. So Ad Astra is set in the near future and it begins with Roy McBride, an astronaut played by Brad Pitt, who falls victim to an energy surge from Neptune and that's caused by the Lima project, which is this top secret project. Um, And it's a famous space station, basically, this Lima project that saw a crew of scientists attempt to contact alien life forms and it was headed by none other than Roy McBride's daddy-o. Yeah, Clifford. Pa- played by Tommy Do- Lee. Yeah, Dr. Clifford McBride. Very American, very um, NASA scientist. Well, I think they have like a plaque at some point yeah. during the movie and he's right next to, is it Buzz Aldrin? I didn't see who it was. Is Buzz time. Aldrin the guy? I can't think. I yeah. can think of Neil Armstrong. Neil and Armstrong, his... Buzz Aldrin, keep... and the one that everyone forgets. Yeah, well, I was thinking Buzz Aldrin, Buzz Lightyear. I couldn't remember his name, but I know yeah. that that's from Toy Story. Uh, so anyway... Obviously, this guy's a big deal, but he's presumed dead. Like, he's been away for ages, and Brad Pitt's character, Roy, has grown up without it. Yeah, so long story short, um, after those global energy surges that are kind of threatening our existence, the U.S. uh, military, they bring in Brad Pitt, and they reveal to him that they think potentially his father's still alive and could be the one instigating these electrical storms from Neptune. So Project Lima that had gone out um, was meant to try to find intelligent life and communicate with them. They think that project that had gone dark and everyone assumed that they died is actually still up and running, and the dad is using that technology to threaten the existence of life in our solar system. So it ultimately ends up with Brad Pitt heading out to Neptune himself to try and rescue his dad and kind of, you know, stop, you know, the impending death of life on Earth, but also to find his dad and bring him home. So with, on that note, what did you think of the movie? I'm in two minds about yeah. Ad Astra. Only two? Yeah. I think it's it's really clearly delineated, actually, my thoughts about this movie. Visually, it is an absolute masterpiece. And I can understand why it's the critic's darling from that perspective. It is absolutely beautiful. It's uh, The colour palette is stunning. The action scenes and the way they do them is just... I just feel stimulated just talking about them. Um, It's just so beautiful to watch. And I think for that perspective, you should go and see it in the cinemas. And then there's this kind of, I also think the actual themes and stuff that we'll talk about later are really beautifully deep in this one. And it's just a gold mine to mine, I guess. Is that what you call it? Yeah. Gold mine to mine. Yep. Yep. You Uh, mine the mines. Mine the mines. But there's some really strange uh, B-grade stuff in this as well. Mm-hmm. I think the pacing is really weirdly off. Jeremy Jarns on YouTube did... I, I watched his review really quickly before I actually went to see the movie just to get a bit of an idea because he's pretty good at uh, mirroring what I think of yep. uh, particular movies. And he said, it's uh, beautiful visually and it's a slow burn. And I was like, when I started to watch the movie, I was like, oh, it's not a slow burn at all. We've just seen a huge gravity style um, action sequence at mm-hmm. the very beginning. And then there's like a baboon in this, like killing someone. This is very action oriented. Yep. Um, but then there's this sudden kind of very long middle 
that doesn't really seem to be going anywhere for a long time so that when you actually get to the uh, next action sequence and the potential um, I just think there's a there's a an error in pacing between the catalyst and the climax so that it's very difficult and very much a one hour different movie that's happening yeah that, that's really interesting I think my, my view is I kind of took and, and maybe if it, for a movie in and of itself that, that makes sense um, I didn't have an issue with the pacing myself in that I felt it was realistic and I thought it was highlighting the vast distances and time considerations um, for things in space. So, you know, it took a while, for, um, it was still exceedingly quick, but it took a while for him to get to Mars. It took a while for them to establish that there was a communication thing. And then it took a while for him to go from Mars to Neptune. Mm -hmm. um, I viewed it that that was um, indicative of the vast distances. And I thought that was that what that commentary was, but I definitely do take um, take your point in that. That can kind of muck with um, the pacing of the movie and it's that, that balance. So, you know, do you do something that kind of indicates um, scientific truths or do you kind of do something that makes a movie flow and feel really tight? So I definitely I definitely get what you mean. Yeah, I think sort of that second one that you said where you, you make it tight for the movie purposes, mm. I think it, it's really something that is necessary for an audience to um, keep pace with what's happening and there's ways that I agree with you that you could do the timing for how long it takes to get to planets but maybe intersperse in a different way than what they did the movie because they had one action sequence with the gravity stuff they had another action sequence with the baboon um, issue and then they also had another action sequence with the moon buggy um, issue and all of that kind of happened within I think maybe half an hour of the movie beginning and then suddenly it was like an expanse of stuff so if they'd kind of said all right it takes this much time to get to Neptune this much time to yeah. get to the moon etc then maybe it could have been done in a different way or a little bit yeah. out of chronological I order think that's, yeah so interesting because I kind of viewed it I'm like yeah you definitely had that gravity thing and then you had the moon buggy one then you had the baboon then you had um him accidentally killing the people on the ship when he hijacks the ship and then you had the issues with the dad as well. I, I felt I felt the action sequences were actually spaced out um, quite well. But okay. the one thing I will say though is that um, the weighting of the action sequences was diff quite different mm -hmm. and very front loaded. So even though uh, I felt the the consequence for the ones on um, the other crew members going to Neptune, mm -hmm. I thought that the that was quite a big deal, but it, was, it felt very downplayed. Yeah, I, I think um, that's actually, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah and so all, all I was going to say is I didn't know, though, if that was um, if that was intentional to indicate because of the artificialness of us being in space that human life can, like, you know, it was potentially to indicate um, the fact that we really don't belong in space and that, you know, danger is lurking at every corner. And it's such a artificial situation for us to be in in that you know if we get a puncture in our suit we die if an oxygen tank um goes down we die um it, it's so so many ways in which we can so easily die i thought that was potentially what they were indicating but i definitely agree in that you know the weighting of the of the action sequences was yeah now on reflection um a little bit too front loaded yeah, I think actually with that, um, the other issue that I wanted mm. to express was um, exposition, but I'll just say something about yeah. what you were talking about. Um, I think that I agree the action sequences seem weirdly front-loaded or, mm. or that they come on you not as a shock, but almost that you recognize it after it's happened. And I wondered whether that's actually also uh, meant to be mm. significant in that it's Brad Pitt who is this very measured uh, beats mm -hmm. per minute is yep. always calm and doesn't seem to react when things around him are pretty dire and so I wondered whether we're actually seeing things happen the way Brad Pitt's character is mm. seeing things happen in that yep someone's just getting blown up or someone's just getting shot and their family's left behind and we're kind of like oh that's we're kind of drawn into understanding what just happened without really having a shock or surprise or emotional reaction. To yeah, it. I agree. I agree. And I think, um, you know, definitely for the ones up the front of the movie, that, that, that made a lot of sense. And you know, I did feel it, you know, when he's hurtling down to earth, I feel he's not breaking a sweat. Mm. Like all these like, you know, oh, I'm trying to stop my spin, but you know, there's not enough atmosphere. Uh, my, my concern is I'm going to lose consciousness. And he almost says it like that. 
Um, yeah, where- and, and you sort of see, I think the first pit where I was like, what, what? As if you wouldn't start to freak out when you see someone essentially hurtling the same way as you saw uh, when the two towers got bombed and someone's jumping off the edge of the building. I think that just made such an a reaction in my mind that I still remember it to this day and I very much got that same thing when the first astronaut comes t- hurtling past him while mm. Brad Pitt's there y- you think oh crap things are going very very wrong yeah yeah if someone's hurtling out into space I'm next he's a very very cool customer but the, yeah I agree so on pop reflection I would have liked to have seen um so you when um, the crew go on the ship going to Neptune die because of his actions he does make the commentary and I think that that's um, around how he's feeling the, um, the more emotional impact of it mm. but would like to have seen it rather than him tell me about it I would really like to have seen him get um, shockingly you know really emotional about it or, or taking it really hard or, or feeling the regret rather than him telling me he's got the regret yeah and I think that's that lends itself to my major point about yeah, what yeah. I didn't enjoy about the movie it's this weird mixture of um, so I don't know if it's because James Gray is normally associated with smaller projects or this was kind of a big epic project. I know he's well lauded for the movies that he has done. Um, however, I wonder whether this was just too ambitious a project for him to do because he's got this beautiful art house ability with the colors and the visuals and, and symbols and themes mm-hmm. and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And then it's mixed with, and I don't know if it's his fault. I don't know if it's the writer's fault. I don't know if it's Brad Pitt's influence, but it's like this B grade Uh, very mainstream um, show yeah tell rather than show yeah aspect of it and it seems like it's incongruent with the rest of the movie like why do these beautiful um, indications of uh, space and then have it with a voiceover from bad going bad 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 (laughs) bad, brad chad Chad. uh, going um oh, space is such a frontier for man, I feel like. like Just this weird kind of very uh, meta stuff that doesn't need to be said. That's for the audience to interpret later yeah, on. I think potentially um, thinking about it now as well, maybe what happens, they kind of painted themselves into a corner a little bit in that they have this Brad Pitt character that is not very expressive with his emotions. Um you know, very calm, very collected, very logical. And because of that, you're not getting the emotional energy that that his reactions could potentially be bringing to the situation. And because of that, they're having to narrate it. That, that's one of the things yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, I just, I just still, I still don't feel like, because the problem is, is the yeah. type of narrations he does are very philosophical, deeply yeah. poetic narrations. Yeah. Yeah. And it just doesn't blend well with um, the what we're actually seeing because what we're actually seeing is something that respects the audience it's something that goes you will find various layers of meaning for you to go away and think about later on we're not going to tell you up front everything but then they uh, juxtapose that with brad pitt going into the government military base and them going oh your dad you know your dad your dad is this person yeah he, his pictures yeah, was, of your dad yeah uh, we don't need silly. to know that like brad pitt should already know what his dad looks like yeah. brad pitt should already know about project lima i mean that would be something that he's probably researched well and truly and tried to find out and probably come across it even though it's top secret information seems like he's in a, a pretty high level of information in, in government anyway and has been subject to these trips that everyone else seems to know about brad pitt's famous dad when he heads out there so there must be information around that brad pitt's been aware of brad pitt's yeah. character i think that, yeah there'd be some yeah i agree i think um the it was a bit ham-fisted the the way that they showed him pictures of his own dad but not like doing random stuff it was like headshots that, yeah. that they take um you know when they kind of go up on, His on their clock. picture or something yeah so i think that was that was a little bit heavy so one thing though that i thought would have been um that they could have got away with the exposition and this would have obviously dramatically changed the um the nature of the film and the ending is that they could have got away with it if this was him journaling his last days if he kind of got stranded out there and he's writing it down um, to recount what had actually happened to clear his name. He could have got away with, you know, the philosophical soliloquies and things like that mm. in that instance. But I agree, it felt like we were getting um, a too filtered um, uh, stream of consciousness that, you know, he was meant to be, you know, it was meant to be telling us what, what, he, what he was going through or what he was feeling because he's not a very expressive person. 
but it was too formal. It was too well, put too together. too obvious as well, like, yeah. and not obvious in some bits. Like, we don't need to know what his psychological experience is and that he realises that he's cut off from human beings because we have seen it through all of his actions to that point yeah. that he isn't able to, uh, that he's constantly getting his beats per minute. They're just yeah. flatlined. He doesn't even cry when he's first thinking about his dad and stuff. It's only, and that would have made the bit where he's actually sitting there and going, you know what, I'm going to do a way with the speech that they've given me to try and message my dad and I'm just going to talk about our experience that, that was, I had when that I was, was little yeah, yeah. if they had not said anything up to that point about Brad Pitt's understanding of his own psychological limitations I would have found that bit a lot more uh, emotional because yeah. it's the first time, it would have been the first time that he'd actually cracked as an emotional being but to that point he's still, he already had that self-awareness so i was like well, what what's the journey that the character's going on here because he's already aware that he can't quite that he's got problems that he can't quite break through on them and i don't know whether he was actually going out to the planet or to find his dad to actually um get something for that journey to, to yeah i think make i had himself a, into a different man yeah i think i, I had um I, I definitely hear your point i had a different um i think when we originally uh, spoke with it straight after the movie i thought the exposition was a little bit sloppy and I, you know um, kind of the golden rule with all this stuff is show rather than tell I didn't find it though as big a, as big an issue uh, I didn't mind it too much um, but I think what was interesting kind of go on that part was the the kind of theme of, of uh, false relationships so I think that was kind of interesting in that um, when you look at what Brad Pitt thought his relationship, you know, he was so inspired by his dad and craving his approval. And, you know, he goes out there because he wants that, you know, um, to see his dad and it feels that it's going to be, you know, really important and things like that. And the dad, either truthfully or because of his insanity, says that he didn't love Brad Pitt's character or his mum. And that even throughout all the loneliness and the kind of being stuck and... Um, all, all the trials and tribulations he had out there in the isolation, not once did he even think about Brad Pitt or, or the mum. Mm. And I think what is funny is that Brad Pitt's reaction to that, in that he's like, I still love you though. And it really kind of, um, it really kind of makes you think about what is it exactly that Brad Pitt loves about his father? Yeah, is it this idealized version? Is well, it yeah, the, the so, version of him from so, his? Yeah, that's what. Like, what, what is it? Childhood. What, 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 what about that person that just told you that just uh, you know he abandoned you and your mum for this grander, you know, his true purpose in life? What he thinks, um, he tells you to your face. I bet he may be insane that he never thought about you. He didn't miss you. He never loved you. What about that makes you think this is a person that I love? Well, I think it was, um, I have my own um, Please, yeah. theories or concerns about that particular bit and whether that was actually real or not, but we can talk about that. Yeah, shortly. yeah, yeah. Um, I think that Brad, because I think Brad actually says at that point, and I know we keep saying Brad rather than Roy McBride, but Who? Brad Pitt is such a better <laughs> name. Yeah. Um, Brad essentially is saying to him, I know dad because he says straight away after that I know so it's almost like he knew that well it's almost like he knew Mm. it seems that he did understand that the dad didn't had chosen space over his family and he knew that from the beginning so it was almost like he he knew deep down that his dad had chosen that and that he still loves him because he understands the choice himself and the decisions that Brad Pitt has made to this point has essentially been choosing his space over his own family. And he gets that. And I think that's where he mirrors himself in his dad. And so he can love his dad for his foibles as well as his major achievements. Yeah. So I I think that's a really good point. Uh, My view is, is very similar, but a little bit different. And I think that the, the, the false relationship kind of then speaks to the pursuit of possibility um, versus what you actually have. And so I definitely um, think that 
the dad um, pursuing the potential of life outside of um, Earth and our solar system at, at the um, kind of uh, ignoring or putting aside the life that is actually here and not appreciating it, but so focus on potential rather than actual. Um, and, you know, they, they obviously mirror that with Brad Pitt making that connection um, when he wants to... Um, when he's reflecting on his relationship with Liv Tyler's character, Eve, and that, you know, he is left someone that does love him. Um, and, you know, there's lots of those cut scenes to indicate that, that um, for the pursuit of um, his dad's approval um, and then also to try and find his dad. And it's that real relationship versus a false relationship or the idea of a relationship. Mm. And I think that, you know, that whole throughout the whole movie, it's contrasted with the dad's view of, you know, ignoring real life on earth and the real you know interactions that you have with people um for the potential interactions with intelligent life outside of our solar system and things like that so i thought that you know that was kind of a really powerful thing yeah. um but, but yeah i did find it um an interesting commentary and something to think about that you know when you um have those relationships um particularly almost exclusively with family is that um brad pitt like i said he loves his father but what exactly does he love about him? And is it, does he love him? Um, or does he just say that he loves him because that is what he has expected or been conditioned to view um, his, that type of relationship with his dad? So I, I think it's just, it's just a real interesting one to think about, particularly given that his dad spent so much time away from him. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's no real answer to that but it's definitely yeah, yeah. something that's really well explored in this one and i would say from the perspective of how every other character is in this movie really interesting take on it the way that roy mcbride is essentially two hours of this two hour and seven minute movie or two yeah. hour and three minute movie and even people like natasha leon who's in there as like a random moon chick moon chick and yeah. ruth negger who is the one that kind of essentially um crumbles down his view of his dad by letting them know that he, his dad essentially killed her parents yeah. because they were wanting to turn back and come back to reality. Yep. And that was aborting the mission and d- endangering the mission for, from uh, Mr. McBride or Dr. McBride's perspective. Yeah. So it's funny that even Liv Tyler, who I thought might have a bit of an Armageddon style uh, girlfriend experience in this one as well, is really just a symbol of life. Yeah. That Roy and McBride relationships. and yeah. relationships that Roy McBride has not experienced to this point ever since his dad left. Well, I th- yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about experience, but I think it's, he's neglected or or really kind of relegated over um, potential relationships. Yeah, and I yeah. would agree with that. But it's just I really loved the way that the movie actually showed that by yeah. not really showing anyone else as a real person, but yeah. Roy McBride and his inner workings. Particularly the character of, that Liv Tyler plays, her name is Eve, and I don't think that that's a throwaway reference. I think it's something that indicates that Adam and Eve aspect of their relationship and that Roy McBride has gone out of the Garden of Eden and hasn't really recognized or has tasted that apple of knowledge yep. and or pursued knowledge, pursued uh, curiosity and gone outside and recognize that maybe Garden of Eden was something that he should have appreciated while he was there. Yeah, it, it definitely is an interesting theme um, to touch on, you know, particularly that, you know, his dad kind of created or paved the way. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it is. And viewing Earth as a Garden of Eden, and compared to the, to the cold <laughs> harshness of space, you know, it, it absolutely is. And what did you think of the cold harshness of space and how they... Cold and harsh. Yeah, but how amazing was it that the how they depicted the future in this particular yeah, case? Yeah, so I think um, both in terms of the cinematography, I think that that was really, really well done. Um, the only reason why I don't kind of sing its praises more is that we have a, a lot of really good um, kind of space, either films or TV shows that do space really well. Mm. So I think because it's done so well by so many people, it's not, you know, something um, in, uh, in isolation that needs to be that's been done in a revolutionary way. However, I think what I did like, um, and I think I touched on it earlier, is that sh- I think they depicted the hostility of space to humans um, really well. Mm. And when I say that, the ease at which we can die, like just how much we are out of our element. Um, you know, we're 
we have to go in space suits um, and if there's a puncture in the suit um, that uh, already inhibits the natural way in which we move and communicate and things like that we're stuffed it's almost like the planets are just going do not pass go do not collect two hundred dollars do not come any further go back yeah turn and, back and i think it just also um you know when you think of things like Star Trek and Star Wars, where, you know, they have these nice ships that have artificial gravity and they have normal light and you, know, you can walk around normal, you can touch people and things like that. Um, the fact that we're not there yet, it, it shows um, also, you know, that this is really uh, uncharted territory for mm. us. We need that the, these external suits. We're, we really don't know what we're doing, but I thought that, you know, they did... They did depict that quite well, mm. um, and I think the the things that they did depict uh, around the technology seemed quite reasonable. Yeah, as well. it seemed very like militant and like if we when we've been to Japan and China and stuff, and we're like, wow, look at this new technology. It very much felt like that, like they just grabbed a Japanese uh, bullet train or something and chucked it on Mars, and that's where you kind of exist when you're going from space station yeah, to yeah. space well, station. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's actually meant to be the the um, Elon Musk hyperloop. Oh yeah, that Which makes is cool. sense. But um, I think what I liked as well was I thought, and I thought it was realistic that on the moon base, the commercialization of mm. it. So yes. you know, he went up with Virgin Atlantic, um, and it was I like a was, really was lovely cool. first class space flight, wasn't it? Yeah, and and it, and it felt like a flight because you know the exorbitant amounts for a bloody pillow and a blanket, one hundred twenty five dollars, <laughs> and also the hot towels that they handed around. Yeah, yeah. And here's your seat, Mister McBride. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was really um, great. And and then when they land, there was an Applebee's. Yeah. Uh, and people getting you know. F- um, so I think yeah, that, that's really interesting as well in terms of, um, you know, it seems like they've got um, somewhat of a colony on, on Mars, but it's quite um, contested because you've got the, the kind of equivalent of the Wild West and you've got mm. that buggy scene. I thought that was a really good scene. So did I. I, really, I actually wished it was longer. Yeah, I, I think it would have been great to explore that a little bit more and also have a little bit more um, of that action because not only was it absolutely stunning to look at, and I loved I love the sound that they used as well. Yeah. Like the sounds very much from inside Brad's helmet. helmet. Yeah, that was done really well. So I was like, are they going to get hit with the bullets? Um, I can't tell whether or not they're going to make it through this. And they probably won't know until they've made it through or they've, yeah. they've died. Yeah, I so agree. So well done. Yeah, so the, the only thing that, yeah, I so I liked also that um, that the base shot missiles at those, at those outlaws at the end. Because I thought at first that they were shooting up just... Um, you know, like fireworks to indicate where it was because mm. the base is on the dark side of the moon. Oh, it's um, dangerous out there. Yeah, I think I would I would like to have seen a little bit more um, with that um, that sequence. But that, that's just because I enjoyed it so much. Mm. Um, I also enjoyed um, what I am coining as Space Deco. And yes. that was the uh, the Mars base. I, you know, in that sound room, I think the colours, and then they got those weird bloody relaxation rooms where you got all that shit projected on the wall and that was freaking making me feel anxious i don't know how that's meant to calm <laughs> anyone down I felt like i was about to get you know like taken onto a steel slab and examined by aliens maybe that's the the um projected artifice of this type of thing that artifice you, yeah that you like tried to um this is your kind of way to be calm. It's like someone yeah, telling yeah. you be calm. Yeah, so, yeah someone telling like you to calm down in, in, an, calm. in an argument. I've tried it on Amy. It doesn't work, mm. weirdly. But yeah, so I thought that type of stuff, I thought the technology worked really well. I thought the problems in space works, uh, w- was quite realistic. Uh, so, you know, when he has the issue, um, when he gets to Neptune with that little, that little pod... Uh, I think things getting damaged um, in terms of how he gets back. You know, don't get me wrong. He's Brad Pitt's character is like the MacGyver of of space travel. I will um, say that was something that irritated me quite a bit. The plot armor as- aspect of yeah. it. That like he seems to be able to skim through where everyone in his wake or before him. Yeah. gets immediately bulleted off yeah. or the only, smashed into something. Yeah, I agree. The only thing I will say, though, is that um, I liked that the solutions weren't super unrealistic. I think the fact that he was the only one doing them, albeit he was very experienced, but I think that they weren't absolutely, you know, no way, no one would have thought about that, or that's such a low percentage play, how come it keeps coming off for him? 
I didn't think there was too much of that. Uh-huh. Um, and, and I just think that, you know, it was just showing that he's very logical. And when he's calm, he's not taken away by the emotions. Yeah, he's see- seeing things that others aren't able to see when they're at the height of their emotions. Yeah, yeah. I would say there was one other thing that I really loved. And I wasn't even sure whether this is something that um, was meant to, was actually deliberate. But Brad Pitt's eyes, yeah, and I know it's it's hard to not get lost in Brad Pitt's eyes for a number of people. But I was wow, watching, this is this is new information. I was watching the color of his eyes change. Yeah, and one so Tommy Lee Jones and Brad Pitt and their uh, similarities to each other visually was great. How they'd kind of darkened Brad's hair a little bit. Yeah, and so it looked like he was his, his yeah, yeah Tommy yeah. Lee Jones' son. Yeah. Uh, because if you look at them kind of in real life, I wouldn't really consider them similar. But they did that so well. And then Brad Pitt's eyes, when he's um, in the military green suit or when he's uh, first embarking on the trip and all that sort of stuff, his the color of his eyes changed to reflect that of the environment. And so I noticed that his eyes were very moss green when he was wearing that military uniform. Yeah. And I think they did that deliberately to indicate um, that he isn't really human, that he has not a soul yet, that he's reflecting his landscape or that he's, yeah, yeah, he's either a chameleon or that he doesn't have the soul coming out yet. So he's just taking whatever the uh, environment is giving him and just doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas when he actually starts to uh, go past the point of no return and start looking for his dad, Um, against the wishes of everyone else there and and comes across Ruth Negger and all that sort of stuff, the colour of his eyes actually changed to a very clear blue. Blue, Yeah. So as if he's received clarity. Yep. Or light. There's there's some sort of light that's shining. I think that's a really really good um, call out. Yeah, because I did notice, um, it's funny you said, I'm not one to gaze into Brad Pitt's eyes um, too much, but I did did remember seeing, I'm like, oh, I thought his eyes were green earlier. Mm. Yeah. I thought, what do you think about Tommy Lee Jones and how they aged him? Like, I love that. He looked like he was from Planet of the Apes, though, right? No, but I love that. Yeah, yeah, I love, yeah. I love that, that they had kind of the baboon um, experience earlier yeah. on in the movie. Yeah, and then, fuck, don't take baboons into space. Yeah. That and, never ends well. They either create their own planet or colonize ours, uh, you know, or they eat this guy's freaking nose off. We've just got to treat them with more respect. No, but Tommy Lee Jones don't, don't is, looks very ape-like. And I think yeah. that was actually doctored to make it so. Yeah. I think that's to say that instead of uh, Tommy Lee Jones being the more um, transcendent human being, he has actually regressed yeah. to potentially what our ancestral means were. And it's also to uh, indicate to Brad that this is what actually happens to humans, that uh, they will become more human-esque as they grow older and as they um, become more um, fragile, like it was hard for him to fit back into his spacesuit and stuff. And so it was almost like in coming out and being more in space for a longer period of time, you only become more, um, the, the pull of the earth still affects you, even if your mind is somewhere else. Yeah, I think um, maybe I'll disagree with you on that in that I don't think that it's shown that you become more human um, or hum- more humanist. I actually found that it was a regression so I think what they were showing, because um, Tommy Lee Jones being, being by himself and kind of descending into madness, that he was regressing um, and being less human and more animalistic. Uh, mm. And I think that's what they were potentially trying to show with him looking more ape-like. I, um, I would agree with that. Yeah. I think it's more that I was saying more human as opposed to more alien. Yeah. And you're saying less human and more primal. Yeah. So still what I mean is from planet Earth. Yeah, yeah, I think I kind of viewed that potentially the, the thing that they were indicating is that when you take humans away from... Like, it, a big portion of humanity is mm. relationships. Mm. Um, maybe maybe the biggest part. And, you know, that, mm. you know, obviously that's what has allowed us to get to the, the top of the food chain. Yeah. But when you take um, the relationships away, you take one of the real core fundamental aspects of being human away from you and you are you become less human and that's why i think as well he you know he's doing things that we can't even understand because it's not what a normal human would do this yeah. is tommy tommy lee jones's character but on that so this mm-hmm. is the part that i've been itching to talk about yes ending the, explain style the ending what did you think so do you think it was real 
Okay, so you've pretty much just like ruined what my theory was. Our theory. Well, I said the theory. I don't know whether you thought it. You just kind of what? went a- went along with it and no, I think poked I... holes in my theory. So point is, ending explained. We'll just yeah. do a quick thing of what yeah. kind of yeah. happened at the ending. And as we pepper through it, we'll talk about our theories with what yeah. potentially happened at the Let's end. Let's do it. So Brad Pitt eventually comes across his dad. Yeah. And his dad's in space. Neptune. And yeah. And his dad says, uh, I, I don't actually... Um, I didn't really love your mother and I chose this and I, yeah. I didn't really love you. Now that Brad seems to take that pretty easily. Uh, I actually think it's at the point where his um, astronaut buddies have yeah. been killed, at, unfortunately, and Brad continues on in the journey. I think that's actually where Roy McBride is um, yep. uh, by himself and unconscious. And from then on, I don't think he necessarily even meets his dad. All right. So let's just back, back up just for one part, just to um, to explain for my um, my purposes, because it feeds into my theory, which you've kind of now claiming is your own. Um, Amy's rolling her eyes in case you guys can't hear that. So uh, there's this part. So after he after um, he hi- kind of what hijacks, uh, kind of stowaways onto the mission to, to Neptune. Um, there's three other people on board and they confront him and the, he accidentally kills them. Um, and, and it truly is an accident. He did, he's trying to say, I'm no harm. I need to do this, blah, blah, blah. Um, they kind of kill through, themselves. In yeah. Kill and through him. the actions. So that, and he takes this really hard. Um, now this is also, um, yeah, he understands because it mirrors as well. His dad killing, um, the other people in project Lima that were, that wanted to turn back. Well, interestingly, his dad actually indicates that that was, a type of self-defense. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So, after, post this um, and the long journey out, oh, is, it, is it 79 days or something like that? Um, Brad Pitt's character kind of descends into madness. And so, uh, he he starts talking to himself. He is really losing his grip on reality. And so, this is the part that Amy and I spent a lot of time discussing immediately after the film in terms of is the rest of the film does it actually happen or is it a hallucination so the reason that it was something that kind of came up for me immediately as it uh, ended there's going to be interstellar spoilers here so if anyone is still interested in watching interstellar i'll yep. say end spoilers when we've actually ended the spoilers in this particular video but there's a theory on the way interstellar ends that essentially uh, Matthew McConaughey's character at some point when he's just about to go through the black hole or whatever it is, or the parallel yeah. wormhole uh, is actually dead. Yeah. And everything that is exper- he experiences after that is not actually something that happens while he's alive, but something that happens on his way to death and he's just hallucinating the entire experience. Sure. And there's certain indica- indicators as to why that happens. Now, I think potentially a theory for the ending of this one is that um, Roy McBride experiences the same thing that he either perishes at the point of being just going mad in space once everyone has died and he's still on his way trying to find his dad which he never finds yep. or that he does hallucinate when he's out there with his dad or not and never actually makes it back to earth or that he makes it back to earth never having actually met his dad Yeah, and so that's where Amy and I's theories um, kind of uh, diverge. We definitely uh, agree that he hallucinates. Well, we think that there's a good indication that he hallucinates the interaction with his dad, mm. and that um, a big part of that is that what happens actually is almost like the perfect resolution of his relationship with his dad. Um, the dad says that he never uh, loved him. Ra ra ra. Brad Pitt accepts it, and th- then the dad. Um, unburdens Brad Pitt's character by jetting off like a madman um, into uh, Neptune's orbit and to, to kind of, you know, kill himself because saying that, you know, he doesn't want to go back to Earth, this is where he belongs and just dies. But you want to jump in there. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things as to why I think that theory holds up so well. Uh, the, the that, that he hallucinated that part. That he yep, hallucinates yep. that part. Yep. The idea of the Tommy Lee Jones character saying, I never loved your mother, I never loved you. That's very self-aware for a character who's gone mad in space. It seems to be very much uh, a direct reflection of what Brad Pitt would biggest fear would be of his dad. 
So he's so if you're going out to see your dad after all this time, a big fear would be that they never thought about you all those years that they were in space. So it's almost like, what can you imagine your dad saying that would just ruin everything? Or, I never loved you. I never loved your mom. Blah, blah. That's something very strange for someone who's in space who sees their son for the first time to say. I kind of viewed it as, um, if it's a, I think it, it is very odd. Um, and it does, I think you're right in that. Um, it's really, you kind of can't have both in that the dad is insane, but also very self-reflective and able to articulate something that's at the core of Brad Pitt's journey out there. Um, the thing I was going to say is, oh, I, I definitely agree, and that the hallucination almost, it's that, that thing in Brad Pitt's um, subconscious or unconsciousness that I think he always knew. And it was that the dad didn't really love him. Or not or love him mom. enough. Yeah. I think well, there's nothing about their inter. I think I kind of touched on that earlier about that false relationships. There's nothing in um, Brad Pitt's reminiscence or photos that indicates that the dad actually loved him. I don't know. There was a there was like a little bit of video footage where the dad is saying just but he's like, "Yep, well, son, now we're headed to Neptune, and love your son." And there was something about that that either it could have been a throwaway line. I mean, maybe Roe McBride just says that stuff because he just doesn't have any feelings whatsoever. But I think it was something that Brad at least has held uh, on Clifford, to. Clifford, the dad or? That Brad has held on to. No, that Roy McBride says. Roy McBride says it? Uh, no, Clifford McBride yep, says yep, it. Yeah, cool. Yep. Brad Pitt's character, Roy McBride holds on to it. Yeah, and I think that, that so for me, I took that as the, um, that is echoed back to him when uh, Tommy Lee Jones says, um, uh, you know, I didn't love you, or I didn't love your mum, blah, 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 I never thought about you guys. And Brad Pitt says back to him, um, you know, it doesn't matter, I love you. Yeah. I thought that I thought that, that was actually the hallucination in terms of there's a psychological resolution of it that mirrors his last interaction with his dad. Well, if I can, yeah, I think if I can remember correctly, I think what really hits home is that he says, I know. And yeah. that's where his eyes start yeah. to fill up. So he knew all along whether or not this is his hallucination of his dad. Yep. Uh, yes, he knows that because that was his biggest fear now yep. realized. Yep. Yep. Um, the other thing that indicates to me that this may be a, um, a working in uh, Roy's brain yep. rather than actually seeing his dad for real is that his dad is essentially pushing away from him the way that Brad's character needs to let go of his father and his father's under thoughts. Well, and well he literally does let go. But that's of what him. I'm saying. Yeah. So the sim symbolism of it, but also the fact that they have an umbilical cord attached to each other in a way. And so he's saying, the father is saying, I'm going to have to sever this umbi umbilical cord. And I think that's Brad's brain actually saying, you have to sever these ties with your dad. Yeah. So it actually is Brad that releases the cord. Um, so it's, yeah, Brad, both uh, metaf metaphorically and physically releasing the connection with his dad. Yeah. I agree. Um, I think, uh, you know, kind of going back a little bit earlier, the part that kind of stood out to me that was a halluc hallucination is that Brad is obviously descending into madness and hallucinating and talking to himself and things like that. I don't see why getting close to where his dad was would somehow bring him out of that insanity. Like, I, I'm not sure how that, you know, when someone kind of descends into madness because of the isolation, I'm not sure that there is anything that kind of strong enough to bring him back in that vastness of space. I would have thought that by that stage, he would have been that cuckoo that, you know, some alert on, on, the, on the spaceship um, telling him that he's nearing the target would actually just, you know, snap him out of it. So you're saying that potentially for our theory to exist that he never actually reaches his dad, dad and never gets back to Earth? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I think that um, if uh, the theory holds that he loses his mind and hallucinates um, the interaction with the dad, there is nothing that happens um, that would bring him out of that psychosis. So I think, you know, an interaction in your psychosis cannot then bring you out of the psychosis. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, and and I, I don't, uh, I'm not able to check it now, but what, um, rolling that forward. So, you know, we have that, you know, he does make that psychological breakthrough of, um, uh, cutting the tether with his dad mm -hmm. and then coming back to, you know, the, the, the relationship that he had with Eve. Um, so, uh, what's her face? Tyler's yeah. character. Um, what I think would be really interesting though. So, you know, when he lands back on earth and we've both discussed this, so, um, mm -hmm. is that, 
uh, when he gets pulled out of the little pod module thing, yeah. it would be really interesting to see if the face of the dude that pulled him out is the same face of the guy that helped him when he parachuted back to Earth at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, so what Ben's alluding to here is something that I thought could be a possible end to the theory. So Ben is very much of the idea that um, it couldn't possibly be that both the Tommy Lee Jones character doesn't exist and that uh, Brad Pitt's character gets to Earth. He essentially goes mad from uh, Ben's main theory perspective and that's that because there's no kind of action that then allows him to come back into his normal frame of mind and get back to Earth and have a normal life essentially. So he has to either be mad or not mad. He has to either have met Tommy Lee Jones or not met him and not reached home again. My thoughts are that there's a possibility that he does get back. I can't account for the... um, psychology aspect or the, or the activeness that brings about a normal mindset after being mad however um if the pos- possibility is real there are two aspects that make it quite ambiguous and i think the first aspect is what ben's saying is that there's an image at the beginning of the film where uh brad uh, falls from that tower in space yep. and reaches the ground by parachute and as he has a pretty horrible landing. I don't know how he doesn't break his bones during that landing. So he probably did. I don't know. I don't think they went into that. No, I think he actually did. Yeah, he he lands it. Yep. Yeah, that was quite amazing. Having skydove myself, I find that crazy that he didn't lift up his legs and and have any issues with broken bones. But either way, when he reaches the ground, there's this very blurry image of people coming towards him. And we never really see who those people are. The same, very same image seems to happen when he comes back to earth after letting go of his dad in outer space and making it back home again and then there's an additional scene once the guys come closer it gets less blurry and the guys pull him out and you can see particular faces of people soldiers uh, military personnel who have come to collect him realizing that he's fallen back to earth again both figuratively and uh literally there's an aspect there that could actually be that he's Uh, projecting this in his mind it never actually happens and he takes the scene from that uh, first time that he falls to earth and mirror images it for another scene where he seems to get back home yep and that may be his tying up of loose ends before he actually goes fully mad or dies out in space the second scene that indicates a potential for this is the way that um, he meets the Liv Tyler Eve character in the bar yep that seems to be either indicating that when he gets back to Earth, he's making amends with his uh, ex-wife or his separated wife or yep. whoever she is. Um, but she also is seen in a very blurry fashion, in a very memory style fashion, first off, before she comes into focus in the bar. And it's the same way that she's seen in a very blurry, symbolic fashion in the first part of the movie when she's actually walking out on him and he doesn't really care about anything but her, uh, but the space expedition and yep. space in general. So to me, that is an indication that there's a potential for that scene in the bar to have happened prior to him leaving for space. Yeah, all that is actually just created it in his mind um, yeah. based off previous images and things like that yes absolutely so there's potential that he doesn't ever get back to earth but i'm saying that there's potential that he does get back to earth but i can't account for ben's argument that um there needs to be an action but my most favorable theory at this point is essentially that he doesn't end up getting back to earth and those are for the reasons of um, him conjuring up images that have actually happened to him before that he tries to sort of make amends with himself before he goes completely dark out in space. Very interesting. Yeah. So what did you guys think of Ad Astra? Yeah. Clearly it's helped us to um, have a bit of a discussion about it that we've actually had for about a day and a half. And we've had a few fights about who thought up what theory, what actually happened, whether or not we how we should actually structure this video all sorts of things that you don't see behind the scenes. Absolutely. So guys, let us know what you think in the comments below. While you're there, hit like, hit subscribe, and we will see you next time. Bye.